Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Wanderer's Wealth, one of the greatest challenges and also one of the greatest opportunities for digital nomads, expats, people who are building businesses abroad is in the world of international taxes. It's not the most fun subject to talk about, but it's one of the most important and confusing that I hear about all the time from those of you in the audience. So I've had Kathy on the show before. She's the CEO of Wanderer's Wealth. And afterwards, I became a customer of hers because her global tax strategy strategy design course is incredible. It literally walks you through all the steps that you need to take in order to take advantage of the international tax system that is set up to actually help those of us that are living this international lifestyle. So it's highly recommended. You can find the link in the show notes for her global tax strategy design course. Check it out and let me know what you think. My guest today is my new friend, Anthony, who is coming to us from Italy, one of the most popular countries in the world to visit and a place that many of us can actually move to and get a passport for, which would give you access to the entire European Union if you have any blood ties to Italy. So Anthony walks us through that process and shares all the details for anyone wanting to make that move. He's spending a whole year there living in Italy and getting his passport. He also walks us through some of Italy itself, some of his favorite regions and places that he's experienced and some of the ups and downs of the whole process. So whether you want to actually follow in his footsteps and get your Italian passport or just kind of take a trip through Italy, this one's a good one. I hope you'll enjoy Joy and please help me in welcoming Anthony to About Abroad. Yeah, man, I am so excited to finally learn a little bit about this process. And I'm going to actually let you kind of set the stage because I, I don't want to say it incorrectly. Can you tell me and the audience a little bit about what we're, we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, so we'll be talking. First off, thanks for having me. This is really exciting for me to be able to share some of this. And it's great to meet you. So we'll be talking a bit about the Italian citizenship recognition process. Basically, what I'm doing is right now I'm living in Italy and through a process called Iuris Sanguinis, which is a Latin term that basically means citizenship by dent, by blood. Through that, that entitles me to be able to acquire Italian citizenship through my bloodline. So in my case, I have great grandparents who came from Italy in the early 1900s, and essentially they pass on the citizenship. And the interesting thing to point out, and we can get into this more, is the way the law reads, I am already an Italian citizen. This process recognizes you as an Italian citizen with the end goal of you getting an Italian birth certificate and an Italian passport. And there's a lot of steps in between, but yes, in theory, I mean, technically I'm already a citizen, but it doesn't mean anything without all the paperwork, obviously. So the people who are that know a lot about this process are very strict. They you're not applying for Italian citizenship. You're getting your already existing citizenship recognized. So it's just kind of interesting. But you know, I don't really tell people here that I'm already citizen. In their eyes. Yeah, that's an interesting dichotomy. I'm sure they're like the the locals are like, look, man, you're a foreigner. Okay, you're you're not from here. But the government's like, no, 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 no. You're a citizen, man. You 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 are you belong. Yeah, yeah. They're they're like, we see your open toed shoes that you wear year round. You're not Italian. Are you a Chaco's guy? I'm not. A Chacos guy. I'm just a sandals, like standard flip flops. If it's just warm enough, I'll wear them. But man, in Italy, they love their closed toed shoes. They wear sandals only for the beach or the pool. And that's it. Otherwise, they're 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 judging your feet pretty hardcore if they can see them. I get a lot of. Co- I am a Chacos guy and a flip flops guy, and I get a lot of comments about these shoes in the in like the southern Europe part of the world, which I like. You're saying I find hilarious because I'm like, it's hot here. Like you guys have coastline everywhere. You don't want to just wear sandals all the time. Very strange. Yeah, this is fascinating. 
fascinating, man, because so I heard about this program, first of all, probably five years ago, six years ago, something like that. I don't think it's been around that that long. Am, am I incorrect in that? Like, is it a relatively new program? It's actually been around for a, a very long, decades and decades. It's just more with maybe with social media and people it's kind of catch the more. And yeah, it's definitely getting more and more popular. I think with like global mobility, people having more access, you know, obviously, I mean, the internet opening it up and then remote work and opportunities to move abroad. So yeah, that's that probably explains why I, I do distinctly think I was told like, yeah, there's this new program in Italy where you can like they're trying. I think the story that I was told was that Italy decided they wanted to bring their people back a lot. of You know, there's like a mass exodus from Italy in the, you know, in the middle of the century. And, you know, there's like a ton of Italian immigrants in the US, for instance. And so I, the story that I was told was it was a process to try to repopulate the, the country in a way and that it was a relatively new thing. But obviously, that was false. And I'm sure some other things were were false. So I'm excited for you to, you know, kind of set me straight in a, in a lot of different ways. Maybe we could start by giving some context. You are obviously not Italian by according to the local standards, the government says so, but you're you weren't born and raised there. So maybe you could tell me a little bit about your background, where you're from, and, and kind of we can work our way up to where you are today. Yeah, so I'm born and raised just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, about 30 minutes north of Atlanta. I am 50% Italian, you know, as we like to say in the US. They they a lot they laugh at that in Italy. They're like, you Americans are so obsessed with your genealogical breakdown, your 20% this and that. But I am half Italian on my through my dad's side. But I lived my whole life in in Georgia, which was a really great place to grow up. And yeah, I would never say that I had a very strong Italian upbringing. It was like some some good Italian cooking that we had at home and some kind of leftover residual cultural things. My dad doesn't speak Italian. His parents didn't speak Italian. They spoke Neapolitan, separate language in the household, but they never bothered the kids. And fair, why would they? It's such a weird language. It's basically useless in the U.S. Is it, is it drastically different from Italian? Like, is it just a dialect of Italian or does it sound like distinctly different? It's distinctly different. It is a separate language and people who don't know Neapolitan but speak Italian, they, they can't understand. It's the most widely spread language in Italy that's not Italian. Okay. And so people are still speaking this in in parts of Italy today? They are in Southern Italy and around Naples, Campania region and other parts it's spread. A lot of them still speak it exclusively at, at home. I, I have a friend, for example, they only speak house. This is kind a fascinating thing, I think, for us, like as Americans, you know, coming from this giant country with 350 million people, and and you know, where you can just cross the entire thing and never hear, hardly hear a different accent sometimes. And then you go to a country like Italy, or like I've been living in Spain, and they're like, yeah, there's seven official languages. You're like, you have seven, you have 50 million people in seven languages. Like this is insane. And I didn't even know when I went to Valencia the other month, I didn't realize that they have, I guess, one of the two official languages in Valencia, it's Spanish, obviously, and then it's how do you say? It exactly Valenciano. Yeah, actually, I got called out on this. I was on I was on another podcast recently, and the guy was like, "Valenciano is not a language." I was like, "Yes, it is." Like, uh, it's in a, they have it listed as an official language. And he he did some Google searching in the middle of the interview and said, it, apparently, somewhere deep in the text, it actually says that it's just a a dialect of Catalan. But if you ask Valenciano, like Valencians, and I think according to Spanish government, it's, its own language, but it is super similar to Catalan. But in Spain, they have they have Catalan, Basque. Spanish, which they call Castellano, and Valencian and Galician. And those are like the official languages. And then you also have like Andalus, which pretty much sounds like another language. So it's like, yeah, it's it, it's like a pretty, pretty small country. Anyway, I've, it is like, it's just it's just interesting for for people like us from Georgia and North Carolina, like you, then you hear, you know, there's Neapolitan, like what? I didn't even know. Right, exactly. So yeah, like I said, grew up in Georgia. I studied engineering, was working as an engineer for about seven years after college and just kind of had a bubbling up in me of wanting to do some something abroad, some kind of expat thing, whether it was working abroad or doing a gap year. I just had a growing itch to do something. And in 2019, I heard about possibility of the citizenship thing. We're we're all eligible for, for getting Italian passports. And he told me about it. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of complicated. Let me know how it works out. It sounds cool, but I didn't really think much of it. And then two years later, I was back, you know, seeing my family. So that side of the family is all from New England. When I was up there visiting for 4th of July, 2021, and talking to my cousin and I said, uh, we were talking more about the citizenship. Like, we should really, you know, try to do this. And th- there's two paths of ways you can do this, which the most people do this through the U.S., through an Italian consulate in the U.S. And I think there's nine consulates. I can get 
more details about that. Or you can do it in Italy. So at the time, last year, we were talking about doing it the consulate in the US. So we thought this could be interesting to do. And I told him, I was like, my cousin's name is Mike. I said, we should go to Italy. And we're extremely fortunate position to have connections to the town that our ancestors came from. So a lot of them emigrated from the small town in the Campania region of Italy to a city in Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts. So through my family in New England, they know Calvinistas, which is my last the American in the US, and they have connections to this town. So through my uncle, this is an immense sign of like luck that not everybody has access to, but it's just, it's just, it's kind of interesting. He got us in touch with somebody over there. Anyway, so my cousin and I planned a trip. I said, let's just go. Let's do like a vacation to Italy. But while we're there, let's do this side mission of going to this town and trying to recover the original birth and marriage records of our great grandparents. And so we, we booked the trip. We went to Rome. It was an amazing time. It was my first time going to Italy. And then we, made the trek down to that town. Prior to that, we had coordinated with somebody in the town, you know, one of our connections who, uh, you know, it's all Italian with them. It was a lot, all Google Translate back and forth. I didn't speak any Italian at the time, just like ciao and grazie. We got in touch with the mayor of the town and we told them we were coming and said, you know, we're so-and-so's nephew and his son, my cousin, we're going to come out and say hello. And also we're going to try to get these documents to help us out. That would be great. We had very little expectations because they, those, you know, they didn't owe us anything. So we showed up to the town. If this is too far down the story hole, feel free to uh, to change course. No, no, this is the, this is what this is all about, man. This is great. It's just too strange not to tell. It's it's interesting. But we so we showed up to the town. We were like an hour late because we were coming from the Amalfi Coast, and the traffic there is crazy, and the roads and everything. Just navigating is kind of a, a challenge to say the least. Anyway, we show up and we're in this small little town. It's about five thousand people. I think it was maybe a Saturday, so it was kind of busy and we're driving through real slow i told the the guy we were meeting up what car we were in and we see this guy kind of jump out of the side of the road and like wave us down he's like hey galvanis and that's kind of how they pronounce our last name and we're like yeah it's like he kind of waved like follow me so mike and i just looked at each other i guess we're following this guy so we just follow behind his car we're just driving and it's like we look at each other and it was like it's like all right mike we're either we're either gonna get like set up to marry two italian women here or we're about to get whacked <laughs> it's just like the mayor is gonna try to have us married this is how like the godfather movies start you know yeah it's like we're gonna meet the mayor's daughters or something neither of those things happened and that's the last mafia joke i'll make but that is kind of the joke that we made it was really funny so we ended up following him and we met the mayor we went into the town hall it's called the comune we went into the town hall and went into the mayor's office and it was just such a surreal experience they rolled out the red car for us they fed us they gave us coffee and this is all because we had the familial not anybody can just walk into the comune and get treated this way so i recognize we are extremely privileged and lucky in this way. But we were chatting with them, talking about it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes good people get blessed with good experiences, you know, like, and I, I think like if you if you put yourself out there enough and with good intentions, like you were going to collect your grandparents, great grandparents, grandparents, like, documents, you know, great grandparents document. Like, I don't know. I mean, that that's a pretty wholesome thing to do. Like, I would I would imagine people are like, they're warm up to that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And they, they gave us lunch. They gave us coffee. They did like a little micro ceremony presenting the documents. They had the original books, the original giant text where it was all handwritten, the marriage and the birth record. And then they gave us kind of the digitized eight and a half by 11 format of those. And they took a bunch of pictures with us. And then later that day, like as we're driving home, I was looking at my phone. I was Mike, they just wrote an article about what they literally wrote an article in their local website that they have that region. And it was like so excited that we were there that they wrote this whole story. Oh, the Americans come and the Italians respond and take care of them. And it was such an amazing strange day and we spent the whole day with the, with the mayor well most of the day with the mayor and some other people it was such a bizarre but like beautiful and amazing experience so what a warm welcome home right exactly exactly i mean it was it was my first time in that town my cousin had been there when he was younger he went with his some time ago so you know we had you know, that definitely helped out and that is kind of where it really started for me because at that time i didn't know anything about the process and the technicalities of what documented i was kind of just following my cousin's lead i was like all right, we need these documents. All right, let's just go do it. And then it was on that trip, I researched some more and realized that you could do the process of citizenship recognition in Italy. And I thought that could be interesting. So then I went home after the trip and it was amazing. Properly fell in love with Italy and the food and everything like everybody does, most of Europe. And I researched the process a bit more and I realized that, okay, to do this through a consulate, let me back up one step. The way the two 
are eligible for this is if your Italian ancestor, your last registered Italian ancestor, so who was a reported Italian citizen, they had to have offspring prior to naturalizing as a citizen of a foreign zone. In my case, our great grandparents came over and had my grandfather before naturalizing. When prior to 1992, the law was if they naturalized in the U.S. or another country that wasn't Italy, just by naturalizing, they gave up the Italian. So if they if they do that and then have kids, the line is broken. They do not pass on Italian citizen. But if they have kids before they naturalize, if they naturalize at all, then they pass it on. And that child is a citizen and they, you know, assuming they don't give up their citizenship, they pass. So in our case, it's been passed on from our great grandfather to our grandfather to our fathers. And um, so that's the critical piece. But presumably at some point, somebody naturalized in that. Yes. And so I'm trying to think through the the process, like <laughs> like I'm going through those steps in the mm. genealogy. So what happened if you're like your parents were born in the US and so that, that doesn't break the line. It doesn't break the line because they didn't, they had to voluntarily give up their citizenship at that point. It wasn't that they did that. It's it's because they couldn't help where they were born. So by being born in the US, they didn't lose the Italian. They would have had to have actively given it up, which is one of the checks that they do in the process. They go back to the consulates and see where you've lived and make sure that you and none of your ancestors actively went and said, I want to give up my Italian citizenship, which never really happened. Yeah, I was thinking like, who did that? So in your case, like your great grandfather is the one that left Italy, but he had your grandfather before he left Italy. He had my grandfather in the U.S. He came to the U.S. and was not a U.S. citizen. He actually never became a U.S. citizen because he died fairly young. Um, okay. But he never became a U.S. citizen. But he had our grandfather in. And so that doesn't that doesn't break the line because your grandfather couldn't help that he was born. It, it, but if your great grandfather had said, oh, "I gave it up, turning in my Italian passport. I want a U.S." passport passport, that would have broken the, the line. Okay. Yeah. If he did that and then had kids, those kids would not be a time. And can you go back like multiple, ge- like, can you go back as far as you want? And So there's yeah. no limit to the generations as long as it's after. So Italy as a nation didn't exist until 1881. It was unified in eight. Prior to 1861, there was no such thing. So obviously it would have to be after that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point though. Like I, I, I know many of us associate Italy with like, you know, Roman culture and the Colosseum and, you know, you associate Italy with a lot of things. But I think it could be easily forgotten that it's a relatively young country because we associate it with so much history. But country of Italy is actually a, a pretty new country in, in, you know, historical terms. Yeah. And you see that today with the with all the dialects and languages, you know, Italian wasn't fact check me on this, please. But I think that Italy wasn't the official language until 2007, which sounds crazy, but not so crazy when you think about the fact that in the U.S., we still don't have it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that Spain has like six. Exactly. So there were all these sub nations, you could say that had their own languages. And then eventually it's like, all right, Italy's our language. So a lot of people say that Italy is the, what is it? The most spread foreign language in Italy is Italian. I never heard that. That's good. Yeah. There's like Venetian and Genovese and Neapolitan you mentioned. I mean, so, okay, this is coming together for me. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, so once you can prove that your ancestor did not naturalize before having kids, then they pass on the citizenship and then you put in the work because if that happened, they broke the line. Don't waste your time collecting doc. Unfortunately, not happen. The other important thing too is for a while, it could only be passed on through the male side. For females, it was not possible until 1948. And there was a change in the law that said after 1948 to be passed on through females. Prior to 1948, no. But this has been challenged in court thousands of times successfully. And so if it is through your female side of the lineage prior to 1948, you can still do it. It is unfortunately a little bit more work. They haven't made it as easy as the male side, but it is possible. Um, but that, that is interesting to look at, you know, historical discrimination. That it's it, completely ridiculous. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. It's so ridiculous. It makes It makes absolutely zero sense from our vantage point today. But okay. Yeah. And I mean, you know, been a, been a lot of wrongs done to females over the years. So that will add that one to the list. All right. Yeah. So once you've proven that you're eligible, then you begin the process of collecting the doc. So you need, at a minimum, you need birth and marriage records for everybody in the line. And you need to prove that there's you know, an unbroken. Sometimes you need death certificates. It depends on where you do it. So like I said, you could do the consulate route. And I'm speaking from the US point. This is a whole process as well. And anywhere where there's Italian you know, descent. So Brazil has a large population. Um, Argentina has quite a bit. Chile, Venezuela, 
Venezuela, a lot of South America. So you could do the consulate route in your home country or do it through Italy. Now, the difference is through a consulate in the U.S., so we have 50 states, but we don't have 50 consulates. There's 50 consulates, air quotes, because not, of them all, not all of them actually have the authority to issue passports or process citizenship requests. So there's, I think, nine that serve the U.S. So for me, growing up in Georgia, the Miami consulate serves that. And because there's only nine serving the thousands of people who want to do this process takes a while. So get a appointment. And this is just to get the appointment to walk in and submit all your paperwork. The wait list time is like three to five years. So I did as a backup last year, because I, I didn't know what, what my plan was yet. I said, all right, I'm going to make Miami. This was the end of 2021. The soonest I could get was April 2024. That And so at that date, you would have all of your paperwork and it's all notarized. It's all translated. It's all apostilled. I can get into what that is. And I can give plenty of resources because we can't cover it all in this time. But you would submit your packet of information at this appointment after three years, four years. And then they start reviewing. And that alone could take another year year and a half. And if they come back and say, your package was 80% good, but these things you need to check. So they'll give you some homework and then you have a window to do it. And if you miss your window and you can't get the documents, in, then you are at risk of having to restart the whole thing over. have to make another appointment. So I was looking at that like, okay, this could take five years. And you know, it's not like I'm trying to get out of the US as quick as I can. I don't, I'm not in any rush to do this, but I learned that I could do the process by establishing residency in Italy and I could do it in probably less a year. And if that combined with you know, like I said, the the urge to do something abroad kind of pointed to maybe I should just do this kind of a thing. And and I think just from like a life philosophy standpoint, and I only say this because it's it's one of the pieces that led me to being here is I've always been, I would say, moderately aggressive in terms of saving, you know, the whole financial independence, higher early thing. I thought mm-hmm. like I'd like to save and save and invest, invest, do all that so I could whatever, 40, 45, retire early and then do all the cool stuff. And um, But last year I had a trip to Colorado with my best friend booked we were going to go mountain biking out in Colorado in September and then unfortunately there was some news that broke about his wife she was diagnosed with stage four cancer luckily you know we're a year later she's doing well and responding very well very very fortunate but that obviously changed our plans for Colorado so we canceled that trip I said well I can't go mountain biking in Colorado without him so we'll do that at another time for sure but that was kind of a wake up call for me because like, you know, I'm so crazy about saving money and living for saving for the future, which is still important. But I realized like, you know, obviously life is short. Nothing's guaranteed. You know, when you're older and have a bunch of money, what good is it if you're in poor health or God yeah. forbid, you know, something happens and you're no longer around when you're 50. So that was a shift in my mindset to kind of a more moderate mindset, which, you know, I still think obviously important to have financial care and all that. But it was more fuel to the fire for me of taking basically what I'm doing now, which is a gap year saying, you know, this is maybe not the most smart financial decision, but it's a good life decision. And it's, it'll be a great experience, especially considering I had lived in within 20 minutes of the town I grew up for 29 years, my whole life, never lived anywhere else. <laughs> so I went from one extreme to the other, which is really funny when you step back and look at it. I can relate to you. I was just going to say really quick, like I can relate to you. I'm super happy to hear your friend's wife is, is doing well. And a lot of us have those moments that like, like something, you know, you, a life event happens that changes your trajectory a little bit and you go, okay, I, I've got to do this now or whatever. And for some people, it's not so dramatic. And and I would say that was the case for me is I was also going down that same path at about the same time in life, if I'm not mistaken. And like, just like really focused on like career, saving, investing, like doing all the smart things, I guess, like what, you know, what society says is like, this is the smart way to do life. Like you have your career, you invest in, you buy a home as quickly as possible, you pay it down as fast as possible, you diversify your investments, focus on all those things. And like, you know, the rest will like work itself out. And and I still like wholeheartedly believe in a lot of those things. But I recognize like, but I'm also not really living the way I want to be living. Like I have this strong desire to to go explore and I'm just quelling that, like just subduing that all the time. And that doesn't feel like a great thing. Like I was fine doing that for six, seven years, but I realized like I've got to do this for like another like 20 years and that's going to be really hard to do. And, and so I think 
I guess I mention all that because you know I, I rarely meet people like yourself who who regret changing that trajectory a little bit. I certainly don't regret changing the trajectory. Made some some sacrifices on the other side of the equation, like oh, I'm not saving as much as I used to, or I'm not you know doing all those quote unquote smart things that I started out doing necessarily. But I'm still doing some of them, and I'm doing them the best I can. I'm trying to find. You're all, I mean, I'm consistently seeking that balance between the adventure and, and you know building for the future and all of that. So I don't know if that's helpful for somebody listening, but I think it's good to. To kind of that's part of the reason for sharing here is like that's part of the journey. Absolutely, and and like you said, it's to go from one extreme to start at an extreme and then back away from it. You can still keep some of those values, which are still good. You know, it's still responsible to save. It's still responsible to think about that these are all good. Go the other direction. Obviously, you'll you'll do a gap year and you'll burn out after six months. You'll spend all your money. And- exactly. I see a lot of people. A lot of people do that, and that's fine. Uh, you have your you have your like moment in the sun, and then you're you're back to the cube or whatever. But but I mean. It's it's good. I think it's good to have this like sustainable approach, and and I think also people are genuinely happier that way. Like if you go on this like you know we'll we'll call it a gap year for right now, but I mean sometimes it's a couple months or even much shorter. You know you go and you like just dive in head first. You're on you're in vacation mode. Like that really gets old fairly quickly. Like you you miss your old life a little bit, or you start realizing like I don't have a purpose. I don't I need something to do. I don't know a lot of people that that really enjoy that. For, for that long before you start seeking some more meaning. Right. Uh, that's definitely true. I, I definitely understand that now. You you mentioned, so you said the word gap year, but do you have like a, a year mentality or or what is the, what is your thought process? So I do have a year mentality that at the end of the year, my plan is to go back to the US. And But like we were chatting a bit before the show, I think that I would like to incorporate this, what I'm doing now in my life forever to an extent. Obviously, I can't. So with this process right now with the citizen I, I'm not working. Legally, you cannot work while you're w- awaiting this process without a visa, which to me wasn't a, fortunately, it wasn't a big deal for me. I was able to take that time off and use it to explore and such. But I would like to incorporate some a broad component of my life future. I, you know, this will be a year, a gap year, but I want this to extend part of my life where maybe I spend, I don't know, a third of the year in Italy, working remote, doing something but you'll have you'll have an Italian passport, so you'll you can go anywhere and for as long as you want as that unfolds. So that's that's cool to know where your mindset is. I also realized that I digressed us a little bit. So you you were you were talking a little bit about the you could go the consulate route, which you you sort of have that as your backup plan, but you could also just literally go to Italy. I have a question about that. Normally you can only stay in Italy for ninety days as an American or a foreigner, generally speaking, without some sort of like other visa, like just your tourist visa. So did you apply for something that allows you to stay longer? Yes, that's a really good question. So part of the process in Italy, because in theory, you could do it in, in less than 90 days, but you should never plan on that because the, the the process can take a while. Italian bureaucracy is notorious for being not the most efficient. So I came with a plan of minimum six months. And for that reason, you should apply for what's called a permesso di soggiorno in testa di cittadinanza, which basically just means it's a permit that allows you to stay in Italy while you are doing this weird citizen process, you can stay until the process. Ends. I do think there's an upper limit. It might be like two years or something, which pro- if the process is taking that long, something's gone wrong. But so yeah, I do have that visa right now that's letting me stay like, I don't know, I think I'm at maybe 120, 130 days in the EU at this point. So I have that visa. But the funny thing is, I don't actually have the visa. I have an appointment to get the visa and the appointment is in November. But you just have to at least show that you have the appointment. I've come across this as well. Yeah, it's I've I've come across the same thing with like visa renewals and stuff. It's like the it's like this super formal thing where you've got this things in your passport, you know, like whole pages taken up and then it and then when that expires, it's like, well no, look, here on my phone I can show you like I have an appointment or a little piece of paper that says I have an appointment to do this in like 6 months and they're like the officials are like, "Okay, yeah, that's good." At least that's I think that would be the case in Italy and probably Spain. I don't know if something like that would fly in like Germany or the Netherlands. No. I, 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 there's a much more formal process for sure. But yeah, so it's in order to get that visa, you have to do a number of things. So when you arrive in Italy, you have to have a declaration of presence to show that you are in Italy. You have to get a stamp showing you arrived in Italy. So if you come through another EU country, like I connected Paris and I got the stamp there, not in Italy, kind of a headache. So I would tell anybody who's doing this, get a direct flight if you can, it saves you from having to go to the police station. But you have that and that declaration of presence is what you then use for applying for 
for the permesso di soggiorno. And then also you need to have, when you're doing the citizenship in Italy, you have to have residence. So it has to be a apartment, something like an apartment with a lease agreement. So unfortunately, like an Airbnb doesn't lie. Uh, that would be a letter of hospitality, which is the community needs to see a lease agreement that shows that you live here. Like you're not on vacation. You are a resident of this town. And the whole process of the citizenship, the paperwork, everything is processed. So you kind of have a chicken or egg thing, right? Because like, and to make something really clear, you're, you've, you've arrived, like you haven't done any of this before. You're arriving on a basically a 90 day tourist visa, just like anybody else. And then applying for this extension, essentially. Yeah, you, you apply for the extension. And so you, you arrive, you get the, I'm forgetting all the specific steps and it's because I'm using a company that's helping me with it, which I get into. Which I highly recommend for anybody doing like I, I mean not just in Italy, just in general, like hiring a local third party is so well worth it. <laughs> it makes a big difference, especially if you don't speak the local language fluently. So you you apply for residency, you get the residency, they do a check the police come to your apartment and check that you actually live there, ask you some basic questions. And then you get that. And then once you get that, you can submit your citizenship application. You got your whole package of marriage and birth records and all this stuff translated. You submit it to the commune. And then you have a paper that says, I'm awaiting this citizenship. It's at that point, you get the permesso di soggiorno. So you can't get the extended visa until you can prove submitted the airport. So there's a lot of steps. And like I said, in theory, some commune, some people have done it in less than three months, but they're extremely rare. So it's usually a good idea to just do it. And I would always recommend with these things, like my experience working with governments and particularly like ones that have a reputation for just being a bit more bureaucratic or a little bit lower, like you just double whatever they say, like just literally double it. If it's six months, it's t- give yourself a year. If it's three months, give yourself six months. Because otherwise, I mean, yeah, maybe you can get it done in three months or even four months or something, but you're going to be sweating bullets through the whole process, you know? Like you don't want to you don't want to rush this and and feel stressed about it. I mean, it's and, and a lot of it's out of your control. Like you just you can you can go as fast as you want, but you're you're dealing with governments and other people. And, and it's it's a definitely an exercise in patience, flexibility. Things are going to happen that are off schedule. You you know, whatever skills that you had in your head and you got to just roll with the punches. That's why for me being here a year has given me that where I don't really have to worry about drags on a little bit. You know, I, we were initially told, you know, it probably could be done in 90 days, but we're past that at this point. You know, we don't know exactly where the office is at because they're, we're now entering the month of August, which is, you know, the basically the European holiday. So they're running at very limited capacity. So it's an exercise in patience. And my, and luckily for me, I have, I have a lot of patience and I'm flexible enough to be able to not have to worry about it right now. You strike me as a pretty patient guy and you got, and you've given yourself this year and like you're not getting too frustrated about it. I also think it's important to like remember two things like especially for people coming from western country where americans in particular maybe like we come from this like hustle super efficient country that's like we you have very high expectations and that's awesome in a lot of ways but it also creates like a high level of stress and like anxiety in a way like you just expect things you know like even just a small thing like going out to eat like you expect a certain level of service and you expect like your drinks to be full and you kind of have these really high expectations and it works and that's awesome in a lot of ways but going to a place like been my experience in Spain and also in Italy and I I gather from you as well it's like the same it's it slows you down a little bit like yeah things are going to come a little slower maybe it's not going to seem as efficient to you but like if you get into that flow it can kind of be like calming in a way just to kind of go with the flow go with it the same way that they would approach it like just go with it it's going to it's going to happen you don't need to control it just lower your expectations a little bit and and I think it's a good thing for us overall for me it's like relaxed me it slowed me down a little bit like in Spain they say mañana man, you know everything Thing will happen tomorrow and it's like that might mean like one week from now and and at first it's annoying but then you just kind of like ah that's cool that same expectation applies to me like if you tell me you need something tomorrow and i say okay like i don't have to be super anxious about actually delivering that tomorrow I have more time than that. And I don't know, that that change of mindset's been helpful to me. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of refreshing. I think there's there's goods and bads if the whole world operated that way. I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to talk to you on like a six hundred dollar laptop. It probably would cost three grand. Whatever. That's another talk show. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's you're you're right. It's again about finding that that balance and and evening things back out a little bit. We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. 
This season is brought to you by my good friends over at Insured Nomads. They're the absolute best in the business when it comes to providing health, travel, and medical insurance for nomads, expats, and really just all forms of world travelers. I know insurance is often something that's overlooked when we're fantasizing about traveling the world, but it's absolutely necessity that we address this because often the policy you have in your home country isn't going to cover you while you're abroad. And it's also a requirement, as a lot of people may not realize, to actually buy private travel or expat insurance, as it's called sometimes, to obtain a visa or even enter certain countries. So fortunately, there are companies like Insured Nomads to help us with this. Not only do they have excellent coverage and great prices, but they're also providing a first-class experience with additional perks and best-in-class technology via their app. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. I can't recommend it enough. Now, this is a company that was built by world travelers for world travelers. So they know what it's like to find yourself in a difficult medical situation abroad, and they want to keep you from having that same bad experience. So the next time you're planning a trip abroad, whether it's for a week or a lifetime, check out Insured Nomads via the link in the show notes. Hey guys, so many of you write in asking how to support the show best. And if you are listening and made it this far into the episode, then I'm going to presume that perhaps you're one of those people that wants to help. So if that's the case, the best thing you could do right now would be to open up the app that you're currently using to listen to this episode. Go to the little arrow thing that allows you to share, select it and share it to one of your social media networks. That would be a huge, huge help. You can feel free to tag me at DC Warrington and I'll slap you a virtual high five from wherever I am in the world. Thank you so much for the support. We really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy listening to the rest of this episode. It's funny when, with the Italian culture because it is so laid back and I think Spain is pretty similar. In every way, they just are more relaxed and take time with two exceptions. And I've noticed the two exceptions are A, when they're drinking coffee and B, when they're driving. So typically an Italian an Italian cafe, which here they call them bars. I'm not sure what it's like. For, you know, in the U.S., a bar to us is how where you go to drink. Here, a bar is where you go get your, your breakfast, your, your cafe, croissants or cornetto as they call them. And then, you know, they're usually open all day. You could, if you go there in the morning when people are, you know, getting ready to go to work, they'll walk up to the bar, physical bar, and order a coffee and they'll just stand there and drink it and they'll be gone in like a minute. It's like a little espresso shot, right? It's an espresso shot and maybe they'll get a cappuccino, but they don't take their time with the coffee. They don't have, you know, the tall coffees like we have in the US um, where they'll kind of sip it and enjoy it. It's it's a weird paradox that I see. They drink their coffee real fast. They just, they don't savor it. And then you put them behind the wheel of a car and they just, I mean, it's like everybody's, everybody's in a race to get to wherever they're going. And then they get out of the car all of a sudden, it's just back to tranquilo. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to ask you this on the driving thing. And, and for anyone listening, yeah, we'll get back to the visa stuff. I know that's why you're here. But this is fun for us to nerd out on as well. Driving in Italy is notoriously an interesting thing because for the reasons that you just mentioned. And also something I've noticed recently, I have a camper van. Previously, I used to do a lot of train traveling around Europe. And now I'm doing a lot of like driving around Europe. And, and so I've been driving more in Italy in the last few years. And something that cracks me up is the way that the, the ramps are like when you're going to exit a highway, you do like five loops like they're these they're like the windiest, sw like swerviest exit ramps. They're never just like straight exit ramp off, get on the gas station, get back on. They're always like when I'm looking at my GPS, there's like it's like it looks like a plate of spaghetti, like what you're about to do. And and it always just cracks me. I'm like, why'd they build the roads like this? I have I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, just the other day, like or like a couple weeks ago, we were there and in northern Italy and we got off to get on a gas station and we did like three loops and then got to a gas station like on the exit ramp where you had to like back in to your gas to your to pump the gas and then back back out and like do a three point turn and then get back on the road and I was like who who built this like this <laughs> so anyway it's just it's a funny like you have to laugh at it and enjoy it but it is it's a very notorious Italian thing like I crossed back over into France and and into Austria actually and it was like oh nope this that that is gone. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really strange. And the in the more south you get in Italy, the I won't say the worse it gets. The more extreme it gets. The driving gets a little more intense. The the roads get more intense. Everything gets kind of more intense. Um, and the further north you go, the more other European influence there is. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not to say anything bad. It's it, I find it humorous. But yeah, that that disparity between the north and south is also really interesting. So so you've got now you're you're into the process. You're uh you're pretty far along the way do you have expectations that within this year you'll you'll have the 
passport? Oh boy, I hope so. I mean, it seems so. There's nothing There's nothing telling you that actually this isn't going to work out. Really, the point we are now is it's kind of an any day thing. It's like any day now, we're hoping to get a note from the community that we're ready to come in and sign our paperwork. And that's that's. I'm glad you asked that because I want to stress for people who are interested in doing this, you can't look at this as a an easy way in to just go spend time in Europe with an extended visa. It's it's a lot of work. It's expensive if you do it with help, which you should, which I'll, I can say why. It's it's a lot of paperwork and it's you just have to have a lot of patience. You can't have a specific timeline in mind. When I first had this idea, my initial intent was to do a sabbatical from my job and say, I'm going to do this and come back on this day and come back to my job. But I couldn't give them a specific date because it's so open-ended, you know, up to say a year. So you just have to be very flexible and go with, with a lot of flexibility. And if you're doing it DIY, so some people try to do this totally DIY. So they come over, try to find an apartment, talk with the community, do all the paperwork, go to all the appointments to get the permesso and the residency permit and all these things, doing it on their own. And there's horror story after horror story of people just having, you know, Italians in the offices shout at them because they don't speak good enough English or they don't want to help them or they painting a very bad picture of the Italians with this statement. And it's not accurate. But when they, when these people are working and their job is to do the stuff for you, it can be very tricky. You know, I've heard cases where people will have a non-Italian last name and get treated differently. Real thing. So so that's all to say, and you know, there's people who do it DIY and can speak good enough Italian and, and have just, you know, do it successfully. I didn't want to go through that because I had read enough of other people's experience that it pay, it's helpful to, if you can afford it, which is what I'm doing, you basically have a company that helps with the, A, they have relationships with landlords. So they set us up with an apartment. They set us up with all our appointments. They're doing the in-person translations. They picked me up from the train station when I arrived. They're doing all the all the stuff that people really that foreigners really struggle with. It pays a lot to make it make it a lot easier for you for you. So you can, if you're trying to make it an enjoyable experience, which I was, it's made it more enjoyable for me to be able to have that luxury. And finding the apartment is also a big struggle for people to get because without an apartment, and here's the other tricky thing, you want to do this in a comune that A, is accepting new applicants, I'll call them for lack of a better term. Some of them, like I emailed a few at the beginning and they would just say, you know, are you accepting, I'm, I'm planning on moving to Italy to have my citizenship recognized. Are you, I'm planning on going to Italy to have my citizenship recognize are you planning on are you do you have availability for this and some of them just say no we can't accept people right now we're full we have too many people too many people in process so for that reason you have to be very particular about what comune you do it in the nice thing is there's 8,000 comune in Italy to do it in the not so nice thing is there's 8,000 comune in Italy to do it in so it's just very <laughs> overwhelming to know and you can you have everything from Rome and Milan all the way down to towns with 300 people so in one extreme, Rome or Milan, they're so big that there's so many people doing it that the process moves very slow. On the other end, you have a town that's so small that they don't even know that the law exists. And you have to show them the paperwork, the law, the article that says this is a process and these are the steps. So ideally, you want to find somewhere kind of in the middle. And the plus side of using a company for help, they're called a service provider typically. So if you're using a service provider for help, they will have pre-established relationships with a handful, in my case, the one I'm using. They had pre-established relationships with a handful of communes and landlords. So they know that they're accepting applicants. They know the people there. They know if they're not accepting applicants. So it's it's the communes can be pretty sensitive. And the last thing you want to do is get an apartment somewhere you know, find, you know, of the 20 apartment landlords you contacted, one of them finally responded to your email and you got in and you looked at it and you said, okay, I'm going to live here. You get in, you get the lease agreement, you're a resident. And then you go to the commune and realize, oh, they don't want to deal with you or they're too full of applicants right now, or they're just difficult to deal with. And now you're stuck with say a six or one month, six month or one year lease term in a town that it, that can't process you. So it's very risky to do a DIY. Wow. This is super useful information. So le- let me regurgitate agitate what I hear and you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, anywhere. If I were going to start this process, if I were in your shoes and going to go to Italy to start this process, the first thing to do would be to contact these communes to figure out where you want to go establish yourself. Is that correct? I think the first thing would be to read. So there's a Facebook group called Dual US Italian, and they have a companion website that I find to be much easier to read because the Facebook interface is almost impossible to read. They have a ton of guides 
sites and they have people in there who just volunteer their time to help people with this. They're extremely knowledgeable. People are posting questions on there all the time. They have guides on everything about this. Basically, every question you want is answered there. On Facebook, it's kind of daunting and difficult to navigate. Their website is much better. I think it's uh, actually I had it written down. DualUSItalian.com. DualUSItalian.com. Okay, yeah, we'll put we'll add that to the show notes as well. So yeah, so go there, do your research, find the information. I mean, Facebook groups are awesome in this regard, and and like I don't I don't use Facebook at all anymore, but my wife has an account pretty much just for this. Like expat groups and and visa groups are are huge and and so so helpful. People are so generous with their time and and information. Yeah. So people should read that first. Start read all the guides first. I mean, really, you, sometimes you have to read it like three times. It's so much information. You need to understand the process before you start reaching out because you're not really going to know what you're asking. And also, if you just if you just fire off an email to a commune in English or broken Italian, they might not respond or they're going to respond rather. So do some reading first. Read about other people's experience in the Facebook group. And I'll, you know, at the end of this, I'll share my Twitter handle. If people have any questions about this or want to reach out, I can point in any direction. I'm not an expert, but I know a lot. I've done a lot of research on this. And it's 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 overwhelming, but it's if you can do it, if you have the patience, if you have the time, and ideally if you have some additional resources to use a service provider. Yeah. It can be a really interesting and fun experience. I've I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Learned a lot about Italian culture. You know, I'm learning the language, which is a lot of fun. And I want to make sure I've covered all bases for the citizenship thing because it is Yeah, let, let me ask a let me ask a couple specific questions that I know I have in, in case others have the are were wondering something as well. So you you do that research, you know, if we're thinking through this like logistically, you do that research and then you want to, you know, kind of figure out geographically where you might want to go establish yourself during this process reach out to some communes and and figure that out as is there a easy way like you said there's 8000 communes like would you suggest a certain process by which to narrow that down in your case you had you knew where you wanted to go you had the connection and all that but like for me i i don't you know yeah which which i should say i'm not actually living in the town that my ancestors were from and that seems strange and like, you know, why did I do it that way? And the reason is because I did I did contact, talk with some people there and I think they were less familiar with the process. And I think, you know, being in southern Italy, there's a high the likelihood it would take a bit longer and there was too much uncertainty around it and I didn't know how long I would you know, I might get stuck in a situation that was that I can get out of. So the service provider that I'm using set us up in a in a town in in central Italy that is roughly the same size. But yeah, it's through the service provider that I ended up here. So my familial my our familial connection helped us with the initial documents, which is hard for a lot of people. But there's people who can help you dig those up if you don't know where your ancestors are from. So they set us up in this town, and that made that made our choice rather easy. Before I was going to use them, I was trying to do it on my own. I was looking at um, I was looking at Modena, which is a small, small city outside of Bologna, because I, you know, I had g- heard good things about the city in general, and they were kind of responsive to my emails. But then trying to find an apartment is almost impossible if you're not on the ground there. And I just got, I saw that the risks were too high of getting stuck in the lease. So for people to start, you want to narrow down to the population is probably a good first indicator, I think somewhere between 10 and 50,000 people is usually a good size for this. You know, there could, could be more on either side and it depends. And again, there's always exceptions. I've met people who did this in Rome and did it very quickly in three or four months, but those are anomalies. I mean, you know, a lot of people want to go to Rome. They want to live in Rome. They want to live in Milan. You might realize that, you know, with this process, you might not be able to end up in like a, a really cool spot that everybody's heard of. You know, you're probably not going to do this in positive Tano on the Amalfi Coast. You're probably not going to do this in in Turin. That's very unlikely. You can't. You're not going to be doing it in Venice. It's it's going to be in probably a no name town. But we found my cousin and I that we ended up in a quote unquote no name town. We had never heard of it. Nobody's ever heard of it outside of Italy. Most people in Italy haven't heard of it. But we we love it. I mean, the people here are amazing. It's such a cool culture. So sorry, long way to answer your question. Starting with the population is a good one. Obviously, knowing what region you want to be in is important. But you have to keep you know, the main thing, the main thing, which if your goal is to get the citizenship recognized, that has to be priority number one. And so 
you want to go where it's going to be the easiest, where they know the process. Ideally, on their Comune's website, they'll have some literature about the process, which is an indication that they know what it is. If some of them don't have it, it's... And like I said, if anybody wants to reach out to me to help with that kind of thing, I can I can help narrow down like maybe regions to look at, regions to avoid. But at the end of the day, the people who... The most guaranteed way to get this is going to be with a service provider because they will know the Comune's. They'll yeah. know the people's names at the Mune. Let's talk about that a little bit because I, I, I've I tried to do visa stuff on my own. I've done it a couple of times. It's always brutal. And I've just defaulted now to like, I always just hire a service provider. And it's not super hard to find them. You know, if you Google this process, Italy, a a bunch of them are going to probably pop up. So I guess I would just ask you, more generally speaking, like, can you provide any major bullet points around the service, like any advice around finding a service provider, any recommendations, rough, rough price estimates? They, they range. Like you can pay $100 to, to $50,000 to, to get help with this kind of stuff. So, any, I don't know, any details that you could provide that would be helpful for somebody who's just totally unfamiliar with this process? Yeah. So, the service providers, in terms of what they provide, vary. So, in the case of what I'm doing, I did all of the pre work DIYs. By pre work, I mean collecting all the, the familial paperwork, getting everything translated, getting everything certified, putting everything in line, making a package, getting the naturalization documents. I did all that on my own, which saved me some money. You could, you know, if you're Stanley. Tucci and you're, you're rich and you want to do this, you could just pay somebody a lump sum and they will do everything for you. I didn't want to do that. So I did that, a lot of that on my own. So that saved me some. What I'm paying for is the arrive in Italy side of it. So it's the residency help, the apartment, the Mune meetings, appointments and all that stuff. I've seen like if you're going the consulate route, I've seen the packages for that cost anywhere from five to 10,000 because and that that expense it's it's a lot and it's that comes from you know a lot of research it can be a lot of time consuming efforts and things like that um, and some people have people on the ground in Italy that will go find those documents sometimes to do a whole package of the documents and the Italy on the ground in Italy service it can be a little bit more I mean think it's definitely going to be closer to 10 grand in that case for my case being just the Italy side of things it was on the lower end of that so I, I've saved quite a bit by doing a lot of the pre-work on my own, collecting the paperwork. And I think it's good to do. If you have the time and the patience, I mean, you're going to be mailing a ton of letters to a lot of places in the US. You're going to be writing a ton of emails to get, you're going to be ordering a ton of vital records. So you'll be poning up for, you know, birth records and marriage records and translations, which is another cost. And then certifications of those translations, which is called an apostille, which basically recognizes that it is a document that can be used internationally. Not to be confused with notary, a notariz, notarized document, which I made the mistake of doing the first time I had to get something apostilled. I showed up with a notarized version and they're like, this is not apostilled. And I was like, that's like the same, right? And they're like, no. no. Yeah. So doing all that, you can learn a lot about your family lineage, where people live, you know, how many kids they had. You can look at, it's cool. You can look up the census records for your ancestors when they came over. Sometimes they say how much money they had on them, what they did for a living. Like I think my ancestor was, I think it said he was like a shoe shiner or something. It's just these, you know, like adorable 1920s Italian things. <laughs> so you can learn a lot, but if you don't want to do that, you can pay somebody to do it. But I think if you can, and the Facebook group is definitely catered to DIYers. I mean, it exists for people doing it on their own. I think I point everybody to that for, for yeah. any question you have, any uncertainties. And yeah, so I would say between Four and ten grand. I've seen higher, but I think ten grand is generally the high end, and three is probably the entry. What's been the high and the low of this whole experience from from start to finish? You know, from when you mm. when you first got this idea in your head to where you sit today. I'm sure there's been some peaks and valleys, but what stands out as as the high and the low for you? The let's see if I can start with the low, so I can end it on a high note. The low, um, it. I don't know if it's been a low so much as a learning experience, which is that you, I guess it's a coming to reality thing, which is when you, you have a perception of something in your head before you do it, and then you actually do it and you, in my case, move to a new place. Things do become normalized. You know, like we were chatting a little bit about for, before we started recording, 
you find yourself saying things like, like, for example, a few weeks ago, I was flying to the Netherlands. I did a short trip. I had some friends, some old colleagues from the US that were traveling there and I wanted to meet up with them. So I flew to the Netherlands. I had to fly out of Rome and my flight out of Rome was pretty early in the morning and it was too early for me to go from home and get to the airport. So I had to go the night before and stay in Rome. And I said a couple of days before, like, man, now I got to go stay in Rome the night before. I don't want to do that. And then I caught myself like, okay, I just have to get on a train and in two and a half hours I'm in Rome Italy and I'm complaining about that it's ridiculous it's totally ridiculous and the reality of things becoming normalized is is it kind of bums me out a little bit because you do get used to things and I think it just kind of points to being you know trying to be grateful for all these things and that's a huge thing to be grateful for and it doesn't have to be bad obviously be grateful for smaller things but realizing that you know living somewhere is different than being on vacation that's been a real learning experience and uh, it hasn't been a downer but it's been kind of a a little bit of a slap in the face that it, it it changes a little bit once you're here and then it's also the same when like when i have friends that come out from the u.s on trips and they're like all excited about you know they want to come out here and, and see me and do all this stuff and they want to see all these they want to go look at this tourist thing and go see this site and go see this and i'm and i'm more can we just go and just exist in this interesting place and it's it's like let's just go get some good food and have some drinks and walk around and talk to some strangers and maybe we'll go see a site but we don't have to have a you know strict itinerary which not everybody's that way that's I recognize that and none of my friends are really that way, but it, it does change in mindset a bit about like, no, let's just, let's just be, but you also have to remember, okay, your friend paid a lot of money to come out here for two weeks. They want to maximize their time. I get that. So I would say that's been my rude awakening kind of thing, but it, it's ultimately a positive to learn that. That's such a cheesy thing to change, change the negative into a positive, but that's all I can do. I, I think, I think it's really relatable. And I think it's like, it's what a lot of people living abroad go through because you transition from it being like a quick vacation experience to like, this is just day to day life. And sometimes I think the down, the low there can be like when the, when what used to be a really big high, like, oh, walking through this cute Italian village and having that little coffee standing next to another Italian, that was a super awesome experience. That was a 10 on a one to 10 scale for a couple of weeks. And now it's like, a you know, it's just your everyday. And I think that can be a little bit sombering at times where it's like, why doesn't this get me pumped up? You know, like I should be on the same level as my friend visiting. I've only been here for a couple months, but like it, it happens quickly. And I think that can be sombering in its own way. I, yeah, exactly. You hit the nail on the head with that. I don't know. Like, where do I even start? In terms of the citizenship process, that's kind of dull and paperwork so there's not that's just kind of a thing that exists in terms of just the experience at excel this experience itself i would say the flexible travel if you can do it at least for a little bit of time it just opens up so many doors to being able to do things one thing that stands out to me when i was when i first arrived i was staying in florence i had some time to kill before i could move into my apartment so i was staying in florence for a few weeks i think i went to cinque terre for the day it was just a day trip and then i was coming back to florence and i had to like change trains in pisa or something uh yeah it was Pisa and there was come to Italy you'll realize that sometimes the trains are great infinitely better than in the US but sometimes platform number on the app on your phone and the platform number on the board at the train station don't always match and the train that you think is here is actually two platforms over and that's and it goes back to the flexibility sometimes you might just be you know going the wrong direction and that's okay but I was waiting on this platform for my train and it was pretty quiet it was just me and then there was this girl there who was on the same platform and I was like, I don't know if I'm getting on the right train. So I asked her, I was like, are you also going to Florence? I asked her in Italian, you know, you just assume people speak Italian as you probably should. I asked her in Italy, like, are you also going to Florence? And she didn't understand. And I asked her in English and she didn't understand. Turns out she was Argentinian and I had studied Spanish like a tiny bit, but it was enough to be like barely conversational. So I asked her like, are you going to Florence? She said, yes. Because another thing I've learned doing this traveling is if you're going to be late to a plane or you're going to miss a train or your train's going the wrong way it's good to have company so you can be lost at least with somebody else even if they're strange it happened on a connection and if you're you know connecting flights and you miss the plane that's happening it's good to be with other people who are in the same boat anyway so we just started we got on the train and we were just chatting and she didn't speak a single word of english which was i had never experienced that before well, i had but like not not having a like not trying to have a conversation with someone that doesn't speak the same language like that's a new experience yes yeah. <laughs> yes but for me i think that's one of the most fun things in the world in maybe it annoys people to an extent but as soon as she said she was Argentina I was like alright I took Spanish lessons my teacher was from Argentina so I speak it with a little bit of an Argentinian accent I was like let's see how far I can take this conversation anyway so we 
we took the train back. We were chatting quite a bit. And long story short, we ended up going to, uh, she was like, she said she was going to Venice the next day and I was going to Siena. But I thought like, well, I haven't been to Venice yet. So I ended up changing my plans which you can do if you don't have to go to work to the next day. You don't have a commitment. It's like, like, you know what? I just decided to go to Venice the next day instead. So I went to Venice with her and I have a friend that lives in Venice that I reached out to beforehand. I said, hey, I'm coming out to Venice with a friend and just want to let you know we can meet up. We could all grab drinks or dinner somewhere. She said, yeah, that sounds great. And then she said, by the way, I'm teaching. She's a jazz vocal teacher. She said, I'm teaching a course this week that ends tomorrow and tomorrow my students are doing their jazz vocal recitals. So if you want to play i play jazz guitar like gypsy jazz swing she's like if you want to bring a guitar you can sit in with the piano player and play with my students as they're singing that's like hell yeah so i brought the guitar and then we get there and we're you know walking around venice which is beautiful i asked my friend i was like hey my my friend and i are looking for a gondola ride you know the canal boat rides like where's the best place to find one of those rides she's like wait don't don't waste your money on that. I, I have a boat. I have to run an errand. I'll just pick you guys up and I can give you guys a quick tour. So, she, so my friend rolls up to this dock and picks us up and just gives us a private tour of Venice and, and her, her boat because they don't have cars there. They have boats to get around. And it was just, yeah. And so we did that. And then later that night, I went. we went to the her friend's house who has a piano and all her students were there. And there's this beautiful like third floor apartment in Venice with these big windows and the piano and like overlooking the canal. and. Um, I was just playing music with them and there's the Argentinian girl sitting over there. And I just had this moment of like, what the hell am I doing? I just met this girl yesterday. I just met my friend like two weeks ago once. But before that, we were just kind of chatting and WhatsApp and stuff. And it was just so surreal and strange and amazing. And that was the kind of thing that only happens if you have like flexible travel like that. And if you just A, talk to strangers which I've gotten more used to. And also, if you can open yourself up with other languages, I mean, that's just, and I'm new to that. I didn't really start learning anything outside of English until like a year and a half ago. That just unlocks so many things, just social and social and fun opportunities. So that was a big high. And then after after the recital at the guy's house, we all like 15 of us went to this Venetian restaurant and ate this amazing food. And then I had my guitar. Somebody else had a guitar. We pulled the guitars out and we just played music in the restaurant until they kicked us out at like 1230. Because you can do that kind of thing in Italy and they don't care. I mean, that's what I, I've got this like huge grin on my face just listening to your story because that just sounds so idealistic. Like that that sounds like it was written in a book and that's just your your reality right now, which I think, you know, you mentioned like, yeah, that's partly due to the fact that you have this flexibility right now, which may not be the case for everyone or may not be your your reality for forever, but it is right now. And it's and it's your reality because you took that leap of faith, you made the sacrifices, you you did all this. So like give yourself credit for that because a lot of people won't and and I get emails all the time from people listening to the show who say like they want to go have that experience, but they're kind of scared to do it because you do have to make these sacrifices. So I hope that story is is as fun and inspirational for somebody out there going like, you know, I want to go. OK, yeah, I got to go play gypsy jazz guitar in a Venetian restaurant, you know, and, and try to speak multiple languages that I don't really speak because I mean, that's li- like that's living right there. That's that's beautiful. A lot of sounds like a lot of fun. I wish I, I could have been there. I'm, I'm envious. Yeah, it was great. I'm. I'm sure you've had experiences like that. Yeah, I mean, to a degree, but like that, that was a really special one. Funny, funny thing I'll just mention real quick about the train thing is I actually missed a train in Italy. Like when I first started traveling in Europe, I don't know, maybe like 15, 17 years ago, something like that. And I ended up having to sleep in a train station in Italy by myself. Like it was, it was just a kind of a rough experience, a small town, like not, not like you're in Venice or Rome or something like in the middle of nowhere. And I learned at that point, like I promised myself myself then like, okay, I'm not going to do this again. It was just because I was scared to ask somebody a question. Like I didn't speak Italian. And I was like, I don't know how to ask, like, is this the right train or not? I was, my intuition told me it was, but the sign said something different. And I was like, I don't know, the train left. It was the one I was supposed to be on. It was the last one of the night. So I slept in a train station. All to say, like, I promised myself from that point, I'm always just going to ask people. I'm just going to ask more questions. Like I'm going to confirm and reconfirm. And even if you don't, wherever you are, just like ask the questions. And often you end up meeting cool people. They end up helping you. My wife and I were just on a train the other day and like she we did that. She asked this girl a question. We we thought we knew, but they ended up sitting on the train and talking for like the entire route and like having a good time. So I don't know. Just put yourself out there, ask questions, confirm. It normally ends up 
you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, that that man overnight in a Italian train train station could, depending on where it is, could be interesting. But most people here, I mean, I think Spain's the same way. It's so safe. I mean, the biggest risk of anything is like people talk about like pickpocketing, which is definitely a thing in Europe, especially somewhere further south in Italy. But I mean, in in Florence, I remember when I first arrived, something I would never do in, I'll say, some parts of Atlanta. But I'd be walking home at like 3 a.m. by myself in Florence and just feel like totally safe. Now, it's different for a guy. I get that. But it's just you can you can sleep overnight at a train station in Europe and you'll you'll probably be okay. You know, but yeah, I, w- I would felt more comfortable even though it was a little dicey. It was like I felt more comfortable than if I had to do that in you know most parts of of the US. I I can I can say for sure I felt that like level of like I'll be fine. Man, this has been so fun. I feel like there's probably a bazillion questions I could keep asking you. I'm I'm I would actually love to know more, like to talk more about just traveling in Italy and stuff. But I know we got we got to let you go, and you've you've already given me plenty of your time. So thank you so much for sharing the story. We'll include all these links in the show notes that we've mentioned. But where can people follow along your journey, if if anywhere, and and, and we'll add those as well. Yes, they can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Quas Italiano, so Q U A S Italiano, and I'm not super active on Twitter, but I think I'd, I'd like to be more so, especially if I can be a resource to people. And Twitter seems to be the most general. You know, not everybody uses Instagram, not everybody uses et cetera, et cetera. But they can reach me there. I'm I'm going to as much of Italy as I can while I'm here. So I've been to there's 20 regions in Italy. I've been to 10 so far, and my goal is to be through all of them at least, hopefully by March. And I love to give people recommendations, things to go, things to see food to try, et cetera. So if anybody has any questions about the citizenship thing or just traveling to Italy in general, things to look out for, what to expect, what to not expect, don't hesitate to reach out. And that goes for you as well. I'd love to do this again if you want. I, I, I could keep talking about this stuff and travel all day. Yeah, me too. Well, let's let's get out of here on a on a fun high note then. Give us one recommendation off the beaten path, you know, not Venice, not Rome. Where, where's where's one of these regions or, or places within one of these regions that people should put on their bucket list if it's not already? So Naples gets a bad rap. It's people love it or hate it. I love it. I think everybody should at least go and try. And I know that's still a big city and it's, it could be touristy in spots, but go to Naples, go to downtown Naples, walk around, have a $5 pizza. It'll be the best pizza you ever had. Talk to the locals, listen to the weird accent. And, you know, if you're in Naples, go go west a little bit and go out to the peninsula, kind of more off the beaten path in a direction towards like Monte di Procida. So that whole region is beautiful, but give Naples a shot. I don't think enough people do. My response to my own question would be Apulia uh, or Puglia is... Is I I mean I guess I don't know if you counted if it's on the map for most people or not, but Lecce and and that whole area is is really really gorgeous and and a place that I didn't get to until later in my my travels. My like favorite place is Cinque Terre, even though it's super touristy. I just I don't care. I could just go back there a million times. It's just insane. And Sardinia, like. I mean, the list the list just goes on. I would just say Italy is an answer to your question because you can get everything. You can get the most beautiful beaches, the most beautiful mountains. It's all here. Yeah. S- Sicily is another thing. Like you could, we could just do a whole show on Sicily. I feel it's a that's an incredible place. Yeah, I, I I love you. You picked a great place to call home for now, and um, I'm glad we got to dive into it a little bit. Maybe we'll, we'll do a follow up and just go all out on on the country of you know just talking about the different places. That'd be a lot of fun. But I hope I think this one today was really interesting for people who actually some of the most popular episodes we've ever done here are just like kind of like this where we're focusing on how people can actually make the move to a place. I think you, I think you provided some awesome tangible advice, and so thank you for sharing. I'll let you go now. Grazie mille. Let's uh, let's stay in touch. Grazie, Chase. Great to meet you. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter, no spam, guaranteed, or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me, it also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we will see you again next week. Thanks again.